actually took that part. Thank you for recording. I just wanted to introduce Dr. Pivla Gupta. In the words of Dr. Sarkaria, he described it as a stellar researcher with extraordinary funding and tremendous work leverage and metabolic insights into therapeutic strategies. And that sort of stuck with me. That's a quote. And I actually, when I read that, I quoted because I knew that at one point I was going to be introducing Biplav. And since then we have communicated, we have talked, I've been familiar for a number of years with his work. He has significant expertise in um, research and lab capabilities to perform tumor metabolomics, tumor metabolic function, and his vision is to lead a cancer-specific metabolomic efforts. And uh, of course, he's already doing that, but imagine what the world looked like if we have such capabilities at places like the Mayo Clinic, specifically here at the Mayo Clinic in Florida. Uh, Dr. Dasgupta's research focuses on understanding the interface between nutrient and energy sensing. Just think about this, nutrients and energy sensing, signaling and tumor metabolic function and development. A lot of the things that are crucial and vital for us to unravel the mysteries of how to treat cancer. He is extraordinarily well-funded. I was looking at some of his grants and R01 as a PI for the by bystander gene deletions in human cancer, therapeutics, opportunities, and challenges. Another NIH R01 grant in which he's looking at the mechanisms of biguinide sensitive and GBM, and it was renewed. That is a grant that has been already going for several years, several million dollars in funding, co-principal investigator in the identification of novel pathways causing NF1-driven Schwann cell tumors, co-principal investigator in targeting S6 and TAM kinases and P10 deficient glioblastomas, co-investigator in the mitochondria mediated intercellular metabolic coupling and bone marrow regeneration. These are all grants through the NIH and a list of another three or four grants. Most recently, BIP was also awarded a major uh, award from one of our major brain tumor, tumor institutions and in pediatrics, uh, just illustrating the tremendous vision that he has, a tremendous mm -hmm. love for what he does. And we're so, so blessed to have you here today, Bip. I see people there in the room and you can see a lot of people already, 33 people online from several different places. I'm so sorry that I'm not there in person with you, but uh, luckily the fact that I didn't make my trip puts me here for virtual meetings. So that means that I'll get to see you later this afternoon and then we'll get to break bread later tonight. And then mm -hmm. I'll take you to the airport tomorrow. I'll be your transporter tomorrow. How is that? Great, <laughs> looking forward to it, thank you. Thank you, well, I'll leave you in great hands. I'm gonna jump to my own lecture, but uh, we'll catch up later today, all righty? All right, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. If you can have the lights dimmed a little bit. Can you guys hear me? Well, it's a small room, I'll just talk. Just dim a little bit. If it's dark, it's fine. No one's gonna fall asleep, I think. Okay, good, thank you. <clears throat> All right. Um, well, Q is gone, but I really thank uh, I think really thank you for this great introduction. Very kind introduction of me. I mean, uh, what I'm going to do today is um, in the next 40, 50 minutes, uh, walk you through the different uh, research programs in my lab. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> in my lab. <clears throat> so there are. Um, People online here. It should work. Right? There. Yeah. Is it the light? Okay. Mm -hmm. When the brightness is. Is it the right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, you can go put it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, that's fine. Good. It's enough power, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. No worry. All right. So um, so there. I will divide the research program in my lab into two different categories. One is we have, we learn about the metabolic liabilities of adult and pediatric high-grade brain tumors. And I have another program in the lab that we opened uh, about, four, about four years ago, where we try to understand the environmental regulation, the external factors that uh, put humans at risk for cancer development. So I will try, uh, I will try to go through 
uh, a few of this our uh, uh, projects. I I'm not hoping to tell you the stories of everything today. Uh, so we'll tell you a little bit about uh, the story about this energy sensor called AMP kinase, and which was known to be a tumor has a tumor suppressive role, and how through our work in brain in GBM we showed that it just has an opposite role in GBM. Uh, uh, it's we we proved, we showed that AMP kinase is actually a tumor promoter uh, in glioblastoma. I want to tell you a little bit of a story about um, this um, a lipogenic gene called sterile quite desaturase that my graduate student, Nicole, found to be deleted uh, in uh, GBM and other P10 deleted cancers. But this gene was known to be a very important gene for cancer. And so why it gets deleted in GBM with P10, that was very intriguing to us. And so I'll tell you the story about this. At least both these stories are published. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about uh, the unpublished story um, of um, this is a project that my graduate student Ian Mercich is working on. Um, and so we will be trying to understand the metabolic targets and vulnerabilities of uh, this pediatric brain stem tumor called DIPG. We have another project which I don't think I will have time to talk about. And this is um, we're trying to understand uh, mitochondrial complex one inhibitor sensitivity in cancer in general, but in brain tumors to be specific. So as you know that many mitochondrial um, inhibitors are in the clinic, for example, you know, there's metformin and other complex one inhibitors are in different phases of trials in the clinic. But uh, what is not known is that if you have a biomarker for complex one inhibitors, as we try to identify, if you can find a biomarker to stratify patients into sensitive versus resistant. And so there is one project, as I mentioned, that the environmental regulation of cancer, which I'm not gonna to touch, touch upon today, here we are trying to be. We probably all know that you know, diabetes and obesity puts us at the risk of various cancers. This is just a paper that came out um, in Cell. It's a, that how it's a prospective study of about fifteen thousand um, uh, people in in the UK. It just shows um, how obesity and fat distribution of the body and diabetes uh, it puts uh, humans at the risk of various cancers. Fourteen cancers actually. In fact, brain brain tumor is not one of them but a large majority of the cancers are at risk for, uh, to various degrees. So we have, we have a beautiful project on this. We can chat about it later on, but let's move on to the first project. Um, so uh, AMP kinase is, it's a trimer of alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. Um, so the alpha, the alpha subunit is a catalytic subunit so it is an energy sensor. Uh, so what happens is that when the cells have runs, run low in energy, so for example, it depends on the ratio of the ATP and the AMP. And so when the cells are stressed, for example, the tumors are always, always stressed. Tumors, the tumor environment is very stressful. And so it has got, um, it's, it's always constantly running through energy stress and nutrient stress. And so in a stressful environment, AMP can really protect cells by phosphor phosphorylating uh, a lot of substrates and putting a break, for example, on these anabolic kinases like mTOR, um, acetyl carboxylase, ACC, and cholesterol biosynthesis. So all these biosynthesis pathways consume a lot of energy, right? And so if you have, say for example, you're running a car and you have so much gas to run for 60 miles, for example, and you're running at a speed that you will not reach that 60 mile, right? So you have a fuel sensor is telling you, you got to slow down and drive at economy zone so that it can reach the destination, right? So AMPK does it precisely that. So it's telling the cell, you got this much of nutrients coming in, you got this much of um, uh, energy um, uh, coming in at, at this moment. So you got to run at a certain speed. So it really allows tumor cells to survive the stressful environment. But because it also inhibits all these biosynthetic kinases, and this, all these biosynthetic kinases are very important for tumor growth, right? mTOR is very important for tumor growth, fatty acid synthesis, cholesterol synthesis is very important for tumor growth. And because AMPK inhibits all these pathways, for many, many years, for decades, it was, it was thought that AMPK is actually a tumor suppressor because it blocks biosynthesis. But what happened was that um, later on, it was also found that AMPK also, also enhances a catabolism. So it is a master regulator of, let me just push this a little bit here. 
MPEG is a master regulator. Can I just? Yeah, um, just want to minimize this. Yeah, this is good. Yeah. Okay. So AMPK is a master regulator of um, catabolism. For example, glucose oxidation, fatty acid oxidation, mitochondrial ox oxidative phosphorylation, and glycolysis by phosphorylating various substrates. So while in one hand, um, AMPK blocks biosynthesis, it's all on the other hand, it's also very important for uh, carbohydrate fatty acid catabolism. And both are important for cancer, right? Both are imp important for cancer growth. So what is the role of AMPK in cancer overall? So, so after you know, we published this paper, um, I'm going to show the data, uh, we came up with a hypothesis that... I'm going to click on the screen. Yeah, let's click. Okay, and now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. We came up with a hypothesis that the, you know, the, the nutrient and oxygen flux, flux in the tumors are too high. And I think there's oxidative stress and shear stress, and there's a lot of tumor remodeling that is going on because the tumor is constantly adapting to survive. Um, and in this highly stressful environment, AMP activation inside the tumor is probably allows metabolic plasticity for the tumors to actually grow. So it's really the tumors to slow down when there is when there's nutrient and energies uh, in, in short. And when there is fresh flow of nutrients and energy, the AMPK allows the tumors to grow. So it really allows the tumor to adapt to this toxic and stressful uh, tumor micro, micro environment. So this is the hypothesis we, uh, we have, and we, we wrote a review on this. Uh, we wrote a review on this based on our initial observation. Now I will come back to this point about that AMPK is a negative regulator of mTOR. Okay, so mTOR is the biosynthetic kinase that regulates uh, protein synthesis, uh, carbohydrate synthesis, um, nucleic acid synthesis, fatty acid synthesis. It's a master kinase, right? And mTOR negatively regulates, mTOR inhibits mTOR, uh, AMPK inhibits mTOR. Uh, it is very, very well established. So if AMPK inhibits mTOR, how is AMPK allowing the tumors to grow? Because mTOR is needed for the tumors to grow. Right? So this is a question we addressed. So AMPK uh, subunits were uh, highly overexpressed, uh, highly overexpressed in the tumor. You can see that there are three different subunits of AMPK, alpha, beta, and gamma. They are, we found surprisingly, although they're called tumor suppressors, they are more expressed highly in the tumors. That was surprising for us. These are the normal, the two normal, uh, um, uh, this normal brain tissues, and these are the GBM tissues. You can see that the, so you will see that I'm going to show uh, um, uh, immunofluorescence data and Western blots showing phospho AMPK. So phospho AMPK is an active AMPK. Okay. And AMPK phosphorylates many substrates. One of the important substrates is called acetyl carboxylase or ACC. So phospho ACC, whenever you see phospho ACC, it's a readout for AMPK activity. So phospho ACC is high AMPK activity because ACC is a substrate of AMPK. So we saw high levels of AMPK activity in the tumor. And this is our uh, one of our um, genetically engineered mouse, mouse models of the hybrid glioma. You can see wherever you see a tumor, this is HNE, you see high levels of AMPK activity. So, it's, so understand that this is called a tumor suppressor for so long. And now we are seeing high levels of this activity there. So that can be true. Like if P10 is a tumor suppressor, then you should not see P10, high P10 in the tumor. You should see deletion or less expression of the tumor but we see the opposite in, 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 in glioblastoma. So of course, when I was presenting this data in various meetings, I got a lot of frowns that, you know, from the field, especially from the AMPK field that, you know, what is um, happening here? I mean, this is not what is known. So it took us a lot of time to, um, to convince people. But um, then we cultured uh, several lines from primary GBM lines, uh, from, primary, from, from, you know, from uh, patient tissues, uh, some of which we generated, some of which we got from um, by my collaborator, Jan, and um, um, at the Rochester uh, Center of Mail. And so here you can see that uh, there are various lines of uh, primary GBM lines. We have used uh, AMPK silencing RNA. We have used CRISPR, SI RNAs. So various means that we have used, you can see that when we silence the AMPK, the cells just die. And it is really regardless of the genetic background. So it's really, it's really critical for the cells to survive in vitro. And um, 
in the culture, we never use the standard culture media. The standard culture media contains 25 millimolar glucose. No cell in our body sees 25 millimolar glucose. It's generally between two and three millimolar glucose. And inside the tumor, it can be less than one millimolar glucose. And so we do uh, all these experiments between 0.75 and one millimolar glucose. And so that is more relevant. And so we are now using um, a media which is more close to human plasma. Um, so that is kind of optimized to mimic the human plasma. And so we are using this media now, but all these experiments were done in 0.75 to one to two millimeter glucose. Um, so here I'm gonna to try to show you what happens when you silence the NPK. So here in this, in this video, you'll see this is a control cell. Just keep an eye on here, you'll see a cell will just pop up. This is a mitotic cell as it divides into two cells. You can see it divides into two healthy cells. If you now knock out MK, you will see a lot of cells are dying. So these are the apoptotic cells. Keep an eye on these two. You will see that these cells are just, it's just burst. You see this? It's a dispersed. And one more cell is, is just again, again burst. So the cells really die in our culture, you see, when you knock out MPK. So we have done various studies. Uh, we, have, we have done many in vivo studies. Here we have used four different lines. And you can see that we show the data from one line. If you knock out MK, uh, the tumors um, have very hard time to grow. I mean, they ultimately catch up. The animals will, most animals will die, but it significantly delays the tumor growth and then uh, improves the survival of these animals. So to understand the mechanism, yes. Um, I might have missed this, but what subunit of the AMPK did you knock down or did you knock down all of them at the same? You have to knock down uh, alpha or beta. Okay. Thank you. So to understand the mechanism, what, what AMPK is doing inside the tumors, why the, uh, why the tumors need AMPK, we need some RNA-seq and metabolomic analysis. And we found that uh, in the AMK knockout cells, there's a, bi a bioenergetic crisis. So there's glycolysis genes are downregulated that is regulated by HIF1 alpha. So HIF1 alpha is a transcription factor. As you know, that is hypoxia, uh, hypoxia related factor, inducible factor. And HIF1 alpha transcribes uh, almost all glycolytic genes. And so regulated by HIF1 alpha, glycolysis was down and regulated by another transcription factor called GAB-PA is a master regulator of mitochondrial OXFOS. They were all down in AMK null cells. And so we um, did this, um, you know, this seahorse machine we have, we run uh, ECAR and OCAR, try to understand like rate of glycolysis and oxygen consumption. We did that in vitro, uh, that all works, but to make sure that uh, is also happening in vivo, we actually grew tumors in the flank and took the tumors out and put them into, it took us six months to optimize the assay uh, because most of the seahorse assays are done on cells. So, so we, we took, took the, the tumors, tumors out from the flank. So, you know, it's very hard to do this experiment with tumor taken from the brain. So for just this experiment, we grew the tumors in the flank, took the tumors out and ran it. And the seahorse, you can see that MK knockdown will now have reduced glycolysis and respiration. It's not completely blocked. It's the rate is slower now. So um, to understand how AMK regulates HIF1 alpha and GAP-PA transcription, well, first we thought that whether AMK phosphorylates directly HIF1 alpha or GAP-PA. So we could not find any consensus site on HIF1 alpha or GAP-PA where AMK can phosphorylate. So we thought that potentially there is some factor in between, um, in between AMK and these two transcription factors that regulate all this. So we ran, um, we searched some um, publicly available uh, ChIP-seq databases to find out if there's any transcription factor that binds to both HIF1 alpha and GAP-PA. And we find there's one transcription factor called CREB. And CREB, we found that it is bound, it binds to both HIF1 alpha and GAP-PA. And so I'm gonna show you in, in, the, um, uh, in a, the next slide that we, we showed that AMK phosphorylates CREB. And this phosphorylation allows PREB to translocate to the nucleus and bind to HIF1 alpha and GAB-PA. And this HIF1 alpha, then now transcribes glycolysis genes, GAB-PA transcribes mitochondrial genes, and this is how MK now regulates the bioenergetics and survival of the tumors, okay? So you can see that here. So the phosphorylation of CREB by MK is not our discovery, okay? It was known, um, you know, 20 years ago, people have published that, you know, when we run, our skeletal muscles run, go through the same sort of energy crisis, right? 
And when we run, we need more energy. And so AMK in the muscle uh, gets activated. It phosphorates CREB, and that allows the muscle to take up more glucose, okay? And so we followed that. We thought that whether the cancer cells have are really stole has stolen that pathway, and so so we followed that. But there was another publication that showed that way well way before the, uh, uh, we showed. This is not our study. This is two 2015 study. They found that a phospho Krebs is very high in GBM, and this is the same phosphorylation site where we think we thought that AMK phosphorylates. It's the exact same site. And so we thought, we, we thought that that's pretty cool, that things are coming together. So this is the CREB, total CREB, CREB expression in GBM versus the brain. You can see CREB is very high. The phospho CREB is very high. Now, this is the total, this is the phospho CREB in the controlled tumor. And now if you knock out AMK in the tumors, the phospho CREB is gone, right? So in the tumor, the phospho CREB is gone. If you do the experiment in vitro, if you silence AMK, uh, the phospho CREB signal is gone. Now, if you activate AMK with AMK activators, now you can see that you can get back the phospho CREB. This, this is happening in the normal cells. Um, so these are really control experiments to show that AMK is really regulating a CREB phosphorylation. And then we have done many in vivo experiments. We have done uh, HIF1 alpha rescue, GAP via rescue and all that. I'm not really showing all the data, it's all published. But we then, we made, an in, we made an inducible CREB phosphomimetic. And what it does, we mutated the site on CREB that AMK phosphorylates, such that AMK cannot phosphorylate, right? So if AMK-mediated phosphorylation of CREB1 is the important mechanism by which AMK regulates tumor bioenergetics, now if you mutate the CREB site that AMK cannot phosphorylate, then the tumors will have a similar bioenergetic crisis. And that's exactly what happens. You can see that just by expressing an inducible, this is a doxycycline inducible system. Uh, so the cells were expressed, uh, the cells were expressing the CREB mutants when we, when we injected them in the brain and then we fed them ice with doxycycline. Now that just by overexpressing the mutant, we can increase the survival of these animals. And so uh, the question was that um, if there is an AMK inhibitor ever available, will the body tolerate? And when we published this study, there was no AMK inhibitor available. So we did a global AMK knockout animal, gen generated AMK knockout animal, just to see that, you know, if you just knock out AMK in the whole body, if the animal will ever survive. Um, so this was done in the adult animal. We'll never do it in the embryonic because that's not the patient group we treat. We'll treat adult patients, right? So we knocked out AMK around six months of age of, um, of the mice. And, you know, we got between 50 and 80% knockout in various tissues. So there was some residual AMK activity, but, but that, that was, was sufficient, sufficient for the animals to lead a normal life. So this led us to give the confidence that if we have an AMK inhibitor, maybe it will work. And so this is, um, this is our, our effort is now to find a clinical grade AMK inhibitor. There is one inhibitor now, uh, this is probably not clinical grade, but this is one of our objectives. So uh, this is an AMK inhibitor that is available now. It's called SBI 0206965. You can see that we used it on, on several PDX lines and they're all sensitive to the inhibitor. Uh, we have done some PK studies. It does reach the, reach the brain, um, not to a great extent. Its half-life is about two hours. The Cmax is about 200 nanogram per mL. It's not great, but this is all we have, so we studied that. And so um, it, uh, when we treated the animals with this inhibitor uh, IP, it gave a modest survival advantage. You can see that uh, there was between about 18 to 20 days to uh, we got between 25 and 30 days of survival. So we are trying to better this. So we are now collaborating with um, uh, Maria Solensky in the UNC, and she has a nanoparticle uh, that we, she's, com she's, she's combining the, the, this SDI with the nanoparticle. And we are trying to optimize if, to see if we can get a better delivery to the tumor, right? We are also doing ultrasound. Our goal is to try also using ultrasound mediated um, uh, delivery. We can uh, to create the uh, blood brain barrier. Uh, we are also doing the CED. I don't know if you guys um, are aware of this. This is the convection assisted delivery. We're using a pump. So we are actually doing this now. Uh, so our goal is to now combine that with TMZ and, um, and RT. 
So I will come back to this, that AMPK is a known uh, inhibitor of mTOR C1, but we do see uh, co-activation of AMPK and so phosphor S6 is a readout for AMPK activity. So one of these bona fide tar targets of AMPK is uh, of, uh, of mTOR is, is S6 kinase. So whenever you see a high phosphor S6 means it's high phosphor mTOR, high mTOR activity. Anytime you see high ACC, it means high uh, MK activity. So despite MK being a negative regulator of mTOR, we see co-activation of both these kinases in the tumor. So understand that probably the, both these kinases are important in the tumor, but there is some sort of, some sort of some, something is missing that MK is probably not inhibiting mTOR. Somehow it is happening. Or, you know, there are cells where there's, there's some, the circuit between mTOR and MK is somehow broken in these tumors. This is something we are studying now. Uh, this, we are just preparing this manuscript. This is a beautiful paper that uh, will, um, that my one, of my, one of my postdocs has have been working on for the past five years just to make sure that we have, we have um, uh, filled all the gaps. And so here we are showing that Instead of what is known conventionally, in the brain, in the in the glial cells, the astrocytes, and in the brain tumor cells, the opposite is true. Meaning, if you knock out MK, the mTOR signal goes down. And we have a beautiful mechanism that um, I don't think I have the time to discuss about it today. But um, this is uh, the, this is the pathway we worked out for five years. So we're going to show in the paper what is known conventionally is not true in the CNS astrocytic cells. We have a parallel system using fibroblast to show that yes, this pathway is, is perfectly active in other cell types, but not in the CNS. So, um, uh, so loss of so our hypothesis was that loss of AMPK potentially reduces the strength of AMPK signaling and causing hypersensitivity to mTOR inhibitors. So we thought that maybe if you, if you combine uh, AMPK inhibition with mTOR inhibition, we'll get a better protection. So. Uh, you can see this is, these are two lines uh, that we got from um, uh, Jan Sarkaria's lab. So here you'll see we have used control. The blue is control. The red is only rapamycin. This green is one MKSH RNA. And this purple is another MKSH RNA. And this, these were the combination of rapamycin and one MKSH RNA. You can see that if you combine MK inhibition with, rap with rapamycin, this tumor just, just didn't grow. So you can see that, and this, this line is a p deficient line. So we took another line that is p proficient, we get the same result. So it doesn't really matter on genetic background. If you lose AMK and combine an mTOR inhibitor, these tumors have a very hard time to grow. Uh, we took this in vivo. You can see that this is a vehicle. Uh, keep an eye on the days. This is 16 day after cell injection. Rapamycin 16 day. Um, it is AMK inhibitor 16 day, and they'll all die within the within you know, 30 or 40 days. If you combine these two, now these animals survive way longer, like 80, 90 days. So this is something that we are following up now, that if you combine the AMK inhibitor and with other mTOR inhibitors. Um, so in summary of this project, what we have shown so far is that energetic and oncogenic stress activated AMK enhances metabolic plasticity of tumor cells. AMK activation in the high-grade brain tumors is potentially necessary for full activation of mTOR in these tumors. So this is exactly the opposite to what it's known. And then AMK inhibition reduces the strength of mTOR signaling, and this potentially renders the tumors hypersensitive to mTOR inhibitors. And the road to discovery of the clinic will be to test mTOR uh, and AMK inhibitors in combination uh, you know, with uh, TMZ and RT. So that is our goal where we're gonna go. I'll switch gear a little bit and uh, just hold your thoughts if you have any questions, I'll answer all the questions in the end of the talk, I'm more than happy to answer. Um, so this study was um, a study that we had we no, we had no idea we'll bump into. So we're looking at lipogenic genes that are important for brain tumors, lipid pathway genes that are very important for brain tumors. And one of the genes that was really critical for a membrane of structure and membrane signaling is called SCD or serial coit desaturase. So this gene um, is highly overexpressed in most cancers. You can see that this is uh, bladder cancer. The next is breast cancer. 
and the next one is uh, colorectal cancer, normal versus tumor, they're all highly expressed in the tumor compared to the control. If you look at STD in glioblastoma, it's actually underexpressed. So that was surprising for us. So this is a highly important gene, important for tumor growth, overexpressed in all tumors uh, outside the CNS. You touch glioblastoma, it is underexpressed. If you take low-grade glioma, that's like, like this. In low-grade glioma, SCD is overexpressed. In high-grade glioma, it's underexpressed. That was very striking. So we try to understand why. And this is the broad data. Uh, we can see that, um, uh, I mean, just to, this is the a zoomed in data. You can see colorectal cancer versus GBM. It's mostly high, the high, the, the tumor is the red and the normal is the blue. It's mostly high in the tumor and low, uh, low in the normal, except for GBM where the tumor is low and the normal is high. This is the IHC from the uh, human protein at last. You can show, see that the expression of the enzyme in GBM is pretty low. So SCD, um, it is an enzyme of the lipogenic pathway. So what it does, so the two most abundant fatty acids in our body is palmitic acid. It's 16 carbon. It's a straight chain palmitic acid. It is saturated. Um, there's another fatty acid, 18 carbon called stearic acid. It's also saturated, it is straight chain. Okay. So straight chain fatty acids are very rigid, but you know our biological membranes are all flexible, right? And membrane flexibility, if you go back to your you know, uh, biology 101, this is called, the, our membranes are called, this is called a fluid mosaic model. So the fluidity of the membranes is very important for membrane function signaling. So what SCD does is a desaturated enzyme. So it introduces a double bond, right? In this same carbon, 18 carbon or 16 carbon, it introduces a double bond. So what once it introduces a double bond, you see the structure of you see the structure of the fatty acid became from linear to folded. So this folding of this fatty acid is very important for the flexibility of the membrane. So SCD plays a very important role in normal cells and also in, especially in tumor cells because tumor cell membrane has to be flexible because they migrate, right? They migrate through spaces. And we found that this enzyme is actually underexpressed in, in GBM sense. We found why. And so um, Nicole showed that uh, SCD, is, 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 SCD is present in chromosome 10. And in chromosome 10, as you know, that there is P10 is located and P10 is deleted in, in about 50% of um, GBM. So wherever P10 is deleted, a bunch of genes around P10 are accidentally co-deleted. The tumor doesn't know how much to delete. So a bunch of genes just drops out. And so along with P10, many genes, important genes, along with SCD and P10, they're all just deleted. And so this is our validation that um, to show that this is the bioinformatic analysis to show that this is a copy number analysis showing that wherever P10 is lost, there's high chance that SCD will be lost. And this is the two different lines where you can see this, this, is, this is the um, chromosome 10 centromere marker, the green, and this is P10 showing this is, the, this is the same chromosome we're looking at. So wherever there is one copy of P10, there's one copy of SCD. So SCD is truly lost there. And this is to, to make sure this is not happening in the cell lines, we took tumor tissues and you can see that in, in, in this tumor tissues is also one copy of SCD. So it's truly happening in the tumor. And then we, uh, uh, we looked at various uh, lines uh, and we can see that these lines that express P10, they have some uh, expression of SCD and these lines that have low, low amount of P10 have low amount of SCD. But we also realized that these lines that have got loss of one copy of SCD, they have another copy. What happened to that copy? because the expression is very low here, right? So we thought that, you know, one, there's one copy is deleted, other copy should be there. And so we looked at methylation. And so this is the GBM methylome. And you can see that there is differential methylation of, of uh, there's a different probe. Each one is a different methylation probe. So SCD is also methylated here in GBM. And we wondered what is going on here. We still don't know why SCD would be methylated. It's probably an aberrant methylation. And I think a combination of genetic loss and this epigenetic regulation 
because of this, SCD is underexpressed in some in in in, in some DDM patients, and uh, you can see that uh, in some of these lines, these uh, these these lines express this is a combination data of many of these lines. These lines have low methylation. These lines have high methylation. So it's a combination of methylation and genetic loss causes this underexpression of SCD, and so. Um, this has actually real-time biological consequence. It's because these lines that express SCD, they're very sensitive to SCD inhibitors. And SCD is a major target in cancer. Um, there are about 10 or 20 about inhibitors that are, are being developed by various pharmaceutical companies. One inhibitor is actually in phase one, um, phase two for uh, neurological diseases, not cancer. We are we are working with Johnson & Johnson. They own the um, patent of the, um, of the drug. We try to uh, contact them. We, we contacted them to get access to this product. Um, and so these lines are that express SCD, the highly sensitive inhibitor, but lines that express very low amounts or negligible amount of SCD, they are a completely resistant to the inhibitor. So that gives us a window. So we did some uh, PKPD analysis. You can see that. Uh, this is the Tmax. It's about four hours. The Cmax, the maximum concentration in the um, in the brain, uh, and the ECX is about 350 nanogram per mL. Um, we also did PD analysis. We may have to make sure that the drug is on target. So what we did is that um, it's a very cool assay. It's not a kinase that you can quickly look at a substrate. So these are much more difficult assays to do. So we injected uh, isotope labeled. Um, you know this. Um, uh, you know. Carbon, carbon isotopes, these are non-radioactive isotopes, right? Uh, C13, C13 uh, isotopes. And so we took isotope laid labeled steric acid, we injected the steric acid, the steric acid went to the tumor and we injected the animals with the, with the drug. And if the drug goes to the tumor, then it will block conversion of steric acid to oleic acid, right? If the drug goes to the tumor and if the drug is on target, that's exactly what happens. That this is the vehicle and we injected, this is the uh, animals treated with the inhibitor. It blocked the synthesis of oleic acid. So it just shows that the drug goes to the brain and is on target. We did some PT, PKPD analysis and you can see that these, these, these two lines are sensitive to the inhibitor in vitro and they are also sensitive to the inhibitor in vivo because now the inhibitor um, blocks the growth of the tumor and enhances survival. And the cells that were um, resistant uh, in vitro were also resistant in vivo. The inhibitor has no effect on these lines. So we can now stratify patients based on which patients will be, uh, could benefit from this drug and which patients will not be ben benefit from the drug. So as you know, that all tumor cells will acquire resistance, right? So we try to understand the mechanism of resistance to the acid inhibitor. So we treated the cells in vitro for about three weeks. And you can see that the, the tumor treated cells here, they're trying to come back here, correct? So this is where the resistance is gaining. And um, we did some uh, molecular analysis uh, using RNA-seq and uh, reverse press proteomics. And we found out that the gene that is the most upregulated when you treat the cells with the inhibitor is the target itself. So it's a, it's a, a drug-induced target upregulation. So the tumor cells are trying to upregulate the target itself. It's a matter of stoichiometry. For example, if you're treating the cells with say five molecules of the drug, the, the tumor will say, now I will synthesize 15 molecules of the target. So I will drown in them. That's exactly what the tumor is doing. And so here you can see that uh, this was the IC50 of the parental cells, about 12.5 nanomolar. Now they shifted the IC50 to about 50 nanomolar, which means that the cells are still dependent on the SCD, but now you'll need more drug, correct? Uh, but of course, this, is, this can be done in vitro. You can't put patients on that much of drug. So you have to find another pathway. So you can see that the same thing happening. Uh, uh, this is, a, this is a, a viability assay. This is the parental cells, and this is the acquired resistant cells. And two, you can see there are two different lanes, right? So one lane is with the inhibitor, and the other lane, we took the inhibitor off, grew them for seven days, uh, like these cells. Okay. 
but we still saw the SE levels would not come down, which means that there's some more durable changes happening in the cells, probably at the chromatin level. That now uh, permanent changes happen in the cells, now SCD will be upregulated in the cells. Now, to understand why uh, the mechanism, how SCD is upregulated in the cells, we ran some pathway analysis and we found that this one signaling pathway called acute phase signaling is the most upregulated in the acquired resistance cells. And this pathway is regulated by two transcription factors, CFOS and FOSB. And you can see that uh, the FOSB expression just upregulated around the time when the cells became resistant. So we followed the, the, if, if, whether FOSB is the transcription factor that is regulating this acquired resistance of the cells. You can see this is parental acquired resistance, another line parental, another acquired resistance. You can see that FOSB expression is through the roof in the cells. This is in vivo data. You can see this is FOSB um, images of chemistry. This is FOSB uh, in the early stage tumors, so vehicle treated, late stage tumors. You can see FOSB expression is coming up. This is the moment you treat the animals with the uh, SCD inhibitor, already see FOSB expression coming up back, right? And more coming up, uh, more FOSB expression, uh, there's more FOSB expression during the later stage of the tumor as the tumor is becoming resistant to the SCD inhibitor. So this is happening in vitro, this is happening in vivo. And to understand that if FOSB is requirement is specific to the acquired resistant cells and not to the parental, that will be important, right? That it is very specific to the acquired resistant cells, not to the parental. So you can see that if you use the FOSB SHRNA, the parental cells don't care as much, but the acquired resistant cells are completely decimated. So the acquired resistant cells are very dependent on FOSB now. So the, this is a fun experiment we did. This data, this you saw this figure uh, in the previous slide that that cells will acquire this resistance, right? Now, if we start these cells by expressing a FOSB SHRNA and keep treating the cells to see if the acquired resistance will happen or not, it doesn't. So it really requires FOSB to become resistant. So uh, we did some ataxic experiments to understand what has happened at the chromatin level. So it seemed like the inhibitor uh, reprogrammed the chromatin. So there were several genes that were upregulated, several genes were downregulated. And so we followed up what happened to the FOSB. And so we found that um, there are potential binding sites of FOSB at the SCD, um, at, at the, at the SCD regulatory elements. So uh, we did some uh, chip analysis, but the antibodies were not great. We tried three antibodies, chip grip, uh, and the antibodies didn't work for chip. So we did some uh, AIMS assay, traditional AIMS assay. As you can see that uh, there is FOSB binding to uh, the, uh, both the parental and acquired resistant line. But when we mutated the, 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 the probes, the FOSB will never bind now, which means that the binding of FOSB to the SCD promoter region is very specific. But we also, the but surprising fi uh, finding was that although only the acquired resistance cells depend on FOSB for survival, FOSB binds to both parental and acquired resistance cells. So now the question is, why is that? So we now silence FOSB. You can see if you silence FOSB in the parental cells, the SCD expression doesn't go down, which means that FOSB binds to the SCD promoters in the parental cells, but it does not really transcribe it. But it is very important for transcription of SCD in the acquired resistant cells. So this binding was really a novel binding of FOSB to the acquired resistant cells. So of course, because SCD is a lipogenic gene and there is so much SCD is expressed in the cells, in the acquired resistant cells, there was a uh, lipogenic reprogramming in the sequad resistant cells. You can see that. So this is oleic acid and palmitoic acid that are product of SCD that are very high. And every fatty acid that you try, every, every um, uh, triglyceride or diglyceride or phospholipid of membrane that you see, so the gray are the ones that containing more unsaturated fatty acids. And they are way high in, this, in the sequad resistant cells. And the red are the ones that contain saturated fatty acids. And they are way low uh, in the sequoia resistant cells. They're showing that there is a large 
uh, lipogenic reprogramming uh, that happened in these cells. Uh, we don't, un don't understand the full extent of uh, the what it, how it changed the biology of it, but this is the data that we expected and we actually found. And so, uh, in summary of this project, what we have shown that uh, that SCD um, activities required by a group of cells, um, they have they express SCD and they're sensitive to SCD inhibitors, and they acquire resistance through FOSB. There's another group um, of, of of GBM that are resistant to uh, the SCD inhibitors, and they survive or bypass the SCD pathway by unknown mechanism that is currently under investigation. Uh, the story will go, is taking various turns, like, you know, like a, I would say like a crime thriller. I'll tell you a little bit where we are with this. So remember, I told you that the, so now you have to forget about the equine resistance. Just take your thoughts back to the original um, sensitive and resistant lines. So I told you that the, sensitive lines have SCD expression and the resistant lines have very little SCD expression. So our expectation was that because there is very less SCD expression, there will be very less SCD activity. No protein, no activity. To our surprise, we saw that, so this, these two are the SCD sensitive, uh, inhibitor sensitive lines, and these two are the resistant lines. To our surprise, we saw that, and so this is vehicle, this is drug treated, and we are, looking at enzymatic activity. We saw that enzymatic activity is present in both SCD inhibitor sensitive and resistant lines. So, so this is, we are measuring steric acid, acid to oleic acid, acid conversion. We see that when you add the inhibitor, oleic acid conversion is blocked in both sensitive and resistant lines, which just shows that the protein is expressed at a very low level, but the activity is still there. But the cells don't care about the activity because they don't care about the acid inhibitor. So they're probably uh, have an alternative pathway that they're using. So we thought that uh, either oleic acid is redundant uh, or, or in GBM or a novel activity of the, of the synthesis present here in, the, in GBM. So we ran some lipidomic analysis and you can see that um, the first peak here is oleic acid. And the second and third peak, these are all C18 peaks, C18 unsaturated, unsaturated fatty acids, but they're not oleic acid. Importantly, as I showed here, the first peak, which is oleic acid, is sensitive to the acid inhibitor, which just shows that it is oleic acid because it is sensitive to the acid inhibitor. The second and the third peak are present mainly uniquely in the resistant lines, and they are not sensitive to the acid inhibitor, which means that they, they are unique fatty acids. They're all C18 unsaturated fatty acids. They're present mainly in the resistant lines, and they are not sensitive to the acid inhibitor. So we think that they are, these are novel fatty acids. Our goal is to identify these fatty acids. And if you identify these fatty acids and novel, probably novel enzymatic activity, this could be a potential therapy for the other half of GBM. So there was a nature paper that was published a couple of few years ago that showed that there is an alternative pathway to SCD in various cancers. Interestingly, they use many cancer lines, but no GBM lines. And we wondered why they didn't use any GBM lines. So this is the pathway. So the alternative enzyme, I'm not going into the detail, but the alternative enzyme is called FADES2. So FADES2 can bypass SCD in some cancer cell lines. So, the, so some of the cancer cell lines that are resistant to SCD inhibitors are sensitive to FADES2 inhibitors, okay? So we tested um, if this is true in GBM or not. So FADES2 is actually highly expressed in the brain. So we thought that maybe this is the pathway. But when we, when we treated the cells to two, two SCD inhibitor resistant lines with the FADES2 inhibitor, they didn't respond. So we think that GBM lines are very unique. I think they are using other pathways, okay? And so um, metabolic pathways are very interesting because, and very complicated. The moment you try to inhibit an enzyme, the substrate that the enzyme is producing 
if that same substrate can come from the environment, it can block the effect of the endogenous enzyme. So for example, SCD is made, SCD makes oleic acid endogenously, right? It takes stearic acid, makes oleic acid. But oleic acid is abundant in the environment. Any last, last dinner, we had olive oil or whatever oil you had, we consumed a bunch of oleic acid. So if you do an in vitro experiment, if you take the cells, GBM cells or any other cells that are sensitive to the SCD inhibitor, and they will crash. If you do the same experiment in presence of oleic acid, you almost block, you almost block the effect of the inhibitor, which means that if you supply the cells from outside oleic acid, then the inhibitor may not work very well. So if you treat a patient with this inhibitor and the patient is consuming a lot of heart healthy sunflower oil that has been genetically engineered to produce tons of oleic acid, the inhibitor may not work perfectly. Right? So we tested that. So SCD is actually uh, deleted in you know, other tumors also. For example, this is SCD is deleted in, uh, in melanoma. So we thought we'd try another model, melanoma. So in melanoma also, P10 is deleted. As you can see the same two groups, high SCD and low SCD. And just like GBM, they separate into resistant versus sensitive. So we took the sensitive lines. And we uh, formulated uh, two special diets. These are isocaloric diets, which means that there should be no difference in calorie. One diet is rich in uh, 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 oleic acid. It's a sunflower-based oil-based diet. It's got 52% oil, 52% oleic acid. And the other is a coconut oil-based diet. It has 7% oleic acid, right? So one is high oleic acid, one is low oleic acid. And we have four different groups. We have vehicle with sunflower oil diet, vehicle with coconut oil diet, and um, the same two groups with the low oleic acid diet. You can see that when you combine the inhibitor with the low oleic acid diet, the tumors have very hard time to grow. So these are the human melanoma xenografts. You do the same experiment in an immunocompetent model, B16 melanoma model. You see, the, you see this tumors have very hard time to grow if we block the source of oleic acid, both endogenous and exogenous. A very interesting phenotype that we saw with the SCD inhibitor that was kind of unexpected is that if you treat the um, animals with the SCD inhibitor, uh, so this is the vehicle, you can see these wacky blood vessels that you see in brain tumors. You can see this uh, high degree of hemorrhage in these brain tumors. This is completely blocked by the SCD inhibitor. The, the vasculature looks normal and the vessels look normal. This is also true in melanoma. You can see that the vessels look so large and they, they leak and they break and hemorrhage. And you can see that this is completely blocked by the inhibitor. The second thing we observe is that there's a large infiltration of immune cells, specifically T cells, when you treat the animals with the inhibitor. And of course, we did the model in the, in the melanoma model because it's an it's, it's a, it's a, uh, immune heart model. It will not probably work in GBM. Uh, but we are, we are testing that. So then we combine the coconut oil diet with the inhibitor, with the anti-PD-1 therapy to see if you can get a better effect or not. And of course, you will see that here, this tumor just did not grow. This is the group with anti-PD-1 therapy with coconut oil diet, with the acid inhibitor. This tumor will not just not grow. We had very hard time to actually pick up tumors to do this analysis. So now, um, whether a multimodal SCD inhibitor and oleic acid restricted diet may have a significant benefit in patients with uh, anti PD1 therapy. So, this we just, we just submitted the manuscript. Um, so, we'll see what happens with this. Um, if you are running out of time, I think it's error three. I will stop here. Uh, I have, just tell me, I mean, uh, how much time you have, uh, because I have a, the DIPG project I can go through quickly. but. If you have to go to the surgery, you go. We'll talk about it later. You have a few minutes? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, and so, um, so this is the summary that patients can be stratified into two different groups. The SCD inhibitor, acquired resistance is to class B. And I just told you that, you know, if you combine with oleic acid, uh, reduced diet, we can get a better, uh, a better uh, therapeutic value. And we don't know, understand how SCD inhibitor reshapes the tumor vasculature. This is something that we are studying now. So 
we have this project that is really close to my heart because I'm, we work in a pediatric hospital and we are trying to understand the metabolic vulnerabilities of this um, brain stem tumor. There's no therapy for this tumor. Um, this is this, this, the, the five-year survival of, this, of these children are the worst of all uh, pediatric tumors. When the tumors are diagnosed um, uh, you know, between four and 10 years of age, most children will die within eight months to a year. Okay? Very few will survive past one year. And I'm very, I'm working very close with, um, close to um, um, multiple foundations, pharmaceutical companies, and the patients and the patient families um, to really try to find, do something about it. Uh, I met a friend, I was telling them last night, um, he's 90 years old, his child died of GIPG 60 years ago. And the treatment we had or DIP 60 years ago, the exact same treatment we have today, and that is really not acceptable. And so we are trying to find to do something about it. And so uh, this 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 uh, tumor is a genetically not very complicated tumor. It's really driven by this one point mutation in the histone H3 um, H3 mutation that causes um, aberrant um, hypomethylation of the of the DNA and aberrant expression of you know oncogenes in the tumor. It doesn't have whole bunch of tumor suppressors knocked down or um, deleted or a bunch of um, oncogenes that are um, you know, amplified. It's mainly driven by this, um, this um, histone mutation. So uh, we now understand uh, a little bit more than we knew before. This is Ian and Sunny who's working on this project. Ian is graduating uh, soon and Sunny joined my lab as a technician. And now she, is, she has done so well she has been accepted to the um, uh, cancer cell biology PhD program. And so we ran metabolomic analysis um, on cell lines first because you cannot do um, metabolomics and biopsies and uh, on, uh, on autopsy tissues. Most, uh, most tissues from DIPGs are through autopsies because you can't do surgery on the brainstem, right? And so biopsies were very rare. So we just got two biopsy samples after many years, uh, and our results from the biopsy really matches with the results of the cell lines. Uh, so uh, from this analysis of the metabolomic analysis, what we did, we did metabolomics on six, six different DIPG lines, lines and the one normal, normal neural stem cell line, we compared what up and down. And then we also ran RNA sequencing of the same lines, and we combined those two pathways, two omics analysis, the RNA-seq and the metabolomics. And we ran a joint pathway analysis, and that was really powerful. And we found that the purine metabolism pathway is really dysregulated in these tumors. And so um, this, this really helped us to, this joint pathway analysis helped us to pinpoint exactly where the problem is. Because as you see here, the, this substrate called ICAR was, this is the de novo purine metabolic, uh, purine biosynthesis pathway. Uh, this is run by six different enzymes. Uh, you can see that this, this substrate, ICAR, was down 16-fold, and inosine is up 12-fold, which just shows that the enzyme that is functioning at this level is functioning probably at a very fast pace to deplete the substrate and now make the product. So we kind of focused on ATIC, and we are right. Uh, ATIC is the highest upregulated enzyme in the DIPG, in the, in the patients. In the zeograph tumor, you can see high expression of DIPG. In the different DIPG lines compared to normal astrocytes and your stem cells, ATIC is expressed very high. Um, we did some uh, analysis to understand the flow of glucose to the uh, denoble purine pathway. So glucose carbons contribute to both glycolysis and pentose phosphate pathway and serine synthesis. You can see that if you use carbon-13 glucose, you can see surprisingly, as you know that, have heard that cancer cells have a lot of glycolysis, it's actually low here. The conversion, this is fructose one synthesis phosphate from here to here, is actually low in the DIPG because most of the glucose is channeled towards pentose phosphate pathway. You see that uh, 13, uh, 13C5D ribose, this is actually high, the ribose is here. So it's high in the DIPs. So the DIPs are using most of the glucose to channel towards pentose phosphate pathway. You can also uh, examine the amount of um, the rate of denoble purine biosynthesis by using uh, a labeled serine. 
So we use labeled serine because serine donates its carbon and nitrogen to the curing rings. You can see if you use serine rings, you can see that compared to normal neural stem cells, DIPDs have synthesized a lot, lot more um, purines. And so we did the same analysis, the meta metabolic analysis in vivo. This is tumor. So this is two different tumor, two, two different tumor lines that we injected and is n equal to five mice. And this is normal brainstem of the mouse. You can see that just like in vitro, uh, this is, you know, enazine, adenine, uh, adenosine, these are all high, these are all purines that are high in the tumor. So our in vitro data is really recapitulates the in vivo data. So this is, actually, this is really important to know and study because the in vitro metabolism can be very different from in vivo. So it's very important to know what you find in vitro to see if it's actually true in vivo or not. And so uh, we knocked down um, APIC, APIC using SHRNA and you can see that. Uh, so what we do for this, uh, for this type of model because it's a pediatric tumor, we uh, inject the uh, SHRNA in the postnatal day two animals in the fourth ventricle. Okay. Because it's a pediatric disease, we, sh we shouldn't use skull animals. And we follow these tumors, uh, these animals. And you can see that knocking out ATIC by SHRNA significantly improved the survival. Now we have another model. We are using an inducible CRISPR. Uh, this in vitro, you can see that uh, the CRISPR will knock down ATIC. And uh, we, we always test the specificity of our um, knockdown system. So this is a human CRISPR. So this is actually resistant to the mouse ATIC. If we overexpress the mouse gene, then we can rescue the effect, right? So we overexpress the mouse gene and the CRISPR now doesn't work to show that this is a highly specific system. Now you can see that while the control animals die, this is the baseline, and then we treat the animals with vehicle or uh, treat with dogs, the dogs now induces the CRISPR. You can see that the control animals die very quickly, five, 15 days. These animals survive way longer. Right, so it clearly shows that ATIC is a really good target, and the question is how do we target from how do we how do we target ATIC pharmacologically, and so uh, we also found that uh, you all know folate biosynthetic pathway the anti folates they work in leukemia patients but you have to treat them with uh, anti folates um, uh, with uh, with the folinic acid because it can be toxic to the cells. We found that. This, this mutate the DIPG cells overexpress a lot of folate in the cells. There's tons of 40 fold folate in the cells, DIPG cells. So, if the cells are expressing so much folate, how, the, how are the antifolates going to work? Right? And so, the, the cells are not very sensitive to antifolates in vitro. Surprisingly, they are a little more sensitive in vivo and um, uh, surprisingly unlucky. So, we found that the DIPG lines have very high amount of folate transporter. And when we take the normal cells and express the DIPG specific mutation, they now express this folate transporter. So it just shows that the, the DIPG mutation is upregulating the folate transporter and allowing a lot of folate to come in. And so this is also true in vivo. This is the folate probe we use. This is the normal mouse brain and this is the tumor. You can see tons of folate in the, in, in the tumor. And so there is an anti-folate inhibitor of ATIC called LSN. And so we tested whether if you can combine the ATIC inhibitor um, LSN with inhibitor of the folate cycle. So because the de novo purine biosynthesis is intimately linked with the folate cycle. It's also called a one carbon cycle. So we, we question if we can treat the animals with the ATIC inhibitor, LSN, and combine with the folate inhibitor. Will it have a better effect or not? So we, this, is the, this is the experiment that's still ongoing. You can see that this is the, this is the baseline and we had to stop the treatment at 11 days because the LSN inhibitor is very expensive. But you can still see that while these tumors just grew, right? And even after treat, after, after we stop, the tumor is pretty stable. There's one animal that um, where the tumor grew back, but most of these animals, you can see that the tumors, uh, animals are maintaining a stable disease, which, which really shows that, um, uh, that if you can develop uh, LSN as a, as a tool to understand and develop compounds to target this pathway in patients. So I will not go into details, but I would, 
tell you that we do a lot of talk studies. Anytime we treat, uh, we use an inhibitor, we'll do a complete stock study. This is uh, you know, body weight uh, comparison, vehicle versus um, inhibitor. This is uh, uh, CBC, um, uh, whole blood cell count that we do. We do liver enzyme assays. Um, if you want to see if there's liver toxicity or not. Um, we do, as you know, that we did all this PKPD assays for all inhibitors that we try. So we are very really careful. Um, it's very important for grants um, because people are looking at you, looking at brain tumor grants, if you've done the normal talk studies or not. And so or we, are, we are going forward with radiation and methotrexate and low folate diet uh, supplemented with folinic acids uh, in treatment and IVF cells. This is where we are going forward with. Um, I give you the summary, and this is the recently we have been awarded with this, uh, um, this um, award by this Cure Fund Award. This was a global fund. They really fund high risk, um, high reward grants. Uh, we propose two different things. One um, is we found that the mitochondrial uh, pathway is very high active in the GIPGs. Uh, you can see that pyruvate is very high in the GIPGs versus the normal neural stem cells. Um, there is an inhibitor called ISCS. I'll tell you a little bit more of this. So this is, this is the, the GIP lines are very sensitive to the mitochondrial complex on inhibitor called ISCS. And we are going to treat, we're going to go in vivo with radiation plus ISCS treatment. Um, so this inhibitor is now uh, in phase one clinical trials for AML. And so this is, so we can go straight from, if it works in DIPGs, we can go straight to a clinical trial. In AIM-2, we proposed to screen a library of 800 compounds, but those compounds are all known to penetrate the blood brain barrier. So we have we just started the screening for DIPG lines. And we do a lot of metabolomics on adult and pediatric uh, tumors in vivo. If you can see here, this is the, this is the first uh, metabolomics we did on biopsy of DIPs. I'm not asking you to, expecting to read this, but just, I guess you can read this. If you can expand on this, these two are the normal brains, and these two are from two DIP biopsies. biopsies. You can see what pathways are they are using. Amino acid and fatty acid metabolism, right? And this is very consistent in these two patients. It doesn't mean that if you get, uh, if you run uh, metabolomics on five other children, it will be the same. So we, the, our goal is to find out patient specific pathways if they could be targeted. Um, we do the exact same thing for the adults also. You can see that we did the same experiment with the adults, and you can see that in these two patients, uh, the fatty acid oxidation, oxidation is very high, um, upregulated. And so there is actually a partial fatty acid inhibitor that is uh, given to patients for, for heart failure. So if the, if, as long when the patients are alive, can we combine this drug along with you know, standard of care therapy on these two patients, right? So that is, we have to really do a rapid turnover of our data and we can apply this to a patient specific manner. Uh, it's like a personal, personalized medicine scheme. We have this organoids and PDX models uh, that we study. Um, so we have both cell lines and PDXs and organoids uh, for GBM and for the DIPGs that we're trying to build now. Uh, this is my acknowledgement, um, uh, my grants, uh, my collaboration grants, my foundation grants, and well, my collaborators, without their help, nothing would be possible really. This is my lab through the last uh, 13, 14 years of my um, academic life in Cincinnati Children's. Um, uh, this is Ian running the IPG project. And this is Abita running the GBN project now. I think I'm missing, oh, let's see, I'm missing somebody or not. Yeah, I'm missing my current postdoc, I don't know. Sorry, but we had a lot of fun in the lab. But uh, this is my lab. We ran through the survive the pandemic. Um, this is how Ian presents data. Um, I do the babysitting and babies right here. And here Ian is actually presenting data to my collaborator in the UK. Oh, baby, everything works. Um, so thank you very much for your kind attention and patience. Um, any question you have, I'm happy to answer. 
Well, we do have a question from the audience from there. Yeah. Unfortunately, she had to leave. But her question was, did you see any effects on autoph autophagy when you silenced AMPK? Yeah, of course, yeah. Uh, so autophagy, AMPK is very important, positive regular autophagy. And in this tumor, so we actually should go back and look at the tumors in vivo, but we uh, uh, tested the experiments in vitro. Yes, the autophagy went down. So what I'm trying to say is that um, what we see, um, what we see in these tumors, whether autophagy had played a role in vivo or not, we are not fully sure. It will, and again, the role of autophagy is clearly um, dependent on the genetic makeup of the cells. For example, KRAS mutated tumors, as you know, are more dependent on uh, autophagy. And if the RAS pathway is activated in some subset of GBM, maybe um, that pathway plays a role when we knock down AMK. But I would not say that autophagy played a major role in all GBMs that we knocked down AMK. I don't know. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, when you generate the SCD inhibitor uh, resistant lines and you have this upregulation of these unsaturated fatty acids, does this change the phenotype of the cells? I mean, the membrane fluidity, I guess, must be altered. Um, um, can you repeat the question? I, I think I got it. But with the SCD inhibitor, yeah. when you generate the, the resistant lines, you were saying they have an upregulation in the C18 um, Correct, C18-1, yeah. Right, unsaturated fatty correct, acids, correct. right? So I was wondering if it changed the just the general phenotype of the cells. Um, so um, let me see if I can pull that experiment. Yeah, so we, we were surprised by that. Um, so we did that experiment, uh, not on that specific context, but let me see if I can pull that. Um, We, so I don't think I can find it, but anyway. Uh, we have the data, but anyway, so I'm sorry, uh, but um, so, um, so, we did the FRAP assay. So if we do the FRAP assay though, the FRAP assay is a photo bleaching assay. So what you do is you take um, a GFP dye and that uh, labels the membrane and you, you shoot a laser uh, and then it bleaches the membrane. And if the membrane is normal, uh, there is certain time it takes for the membrane to come back together. And it's called recovery of the GFP, right? So the membrane has less plasticities, it's more rigid, it will take more time, correct? So we'd expect that if we uh, use the acid inhibitor, um, you will block the membrane plasticity and it will take more time for GF recovery. And it is true. So if you take the cells that are SCD inhibitor sensitive, so the fluorescent recovery is um, slower. If you take the cells that are originally resistant to the acid inhibitor, they have no change in FRAP, which means that they just don't care about um, oleic acid synthesis by SCD. They have other pathways really. Isn't it intriguing? I mean, it doesn't really, it's really measles, measles to the cell. They completely changed, adopted a different life. Um, so the, our goal is to find this novel activities. If you can find, I bet you it will be a science paper because this will be like a, a, a novel activity. And so our goal is to try to identify those two lipids, what they are. We ran some GCs, we ran into some trouble, but um, I'm pretty sure we're gonna get there. So, the question you want as in there a question. We had a lot of messages with congratulations. Oh, I only have you. one question. I know we're already running out of time. Yeah. When you did the lipidomic analysis and you found those two new peaks, did you look into whether or not those were constant among different sample types, like different patients or even different parts of the same tumor? So the the lipidomic analysis we did is in vitro. Oh, okay. So now we are we have collected all these patient samples. Um, so we are going to send those patient samples 
to find out what those peaks are if they match in vitro versus in vivo. They have to be there in the tumor. The question is if they are also the tumor specific or also in the normal brain or not. We just don't know. We think it's tumor specific, but um, yeah, it has to happen in vivo. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. I don't know if anyone else has any other questions. Thank you so much for your Thank time. you very Thank much. You so Thank much. you.